hope Phil Pritchard doesn't take it personally, but the Oilers didn't want to see him for three straight. They were 2-9-1. They were 0-3. And, and they will Monday night play a one-game showdown for the All the Marbles and the Stanley Cup. Welcome to 32 Thoughts, the podcast presented by the GMC Sierra Elevation. Elliot, one thing that you probably know about me by now, we've known each other going back to what, like 94, 95? You ask weird questions. There is that. That is true. But let's you bracket, have weird ideas. Let's bracket all of these things for <laughs> now, Elliot. Um, here's one thing that I think you know about me by now. I okay. really try hard not to be jealous of people. I try to celebrate when people are part of big events and great things happen to them and try not to play, woe is me, I wish I was part of that. But Elliot, I'm really jealous of everybody that was at that rink in Edmondson on Friday night for that game and that experience and that noise. I've already lost, I don't know how much of my hearing in my life, but <laughs> I'd be willing to risk even more just so I could have been at that rink, Rogers Place, Friday night, to be part of that event. No question to start, just the floor is yours. Thoughts on Friday? Every time the Oilers are winning a game in the third period, it's karaoke. <laughs> it really is, you're yes. right. Yeah, a lot of really living is. on the prayer, <laughs> some Shania Twain, La Bamba at the end of the yeah, game. Yeah, that's great. Good music, good music mix in there. Sure. Uh, it was... Uh, Including some newer stuff too. It isn't all the old, old rock stuff from uh, the '80s that I love so much. Uh, it, it was from the, from the moment they got into that building, very confident crowd, very confident crowd, not nervous, alive. Uh, from the moment things really got started, great anthem again, excited. Nothing really happened that knocked them out of the game. Like Edmonton had some really good shifts early. Bobrovsky held. Then Florida started to put together some good shifts. Maybe not a lot of shots, and we'll get to that in a second, but definitely a lot of zone time. They they kind of controlled the flow of play for a little while, but nothing overly bad happened. Crowd never lost faith. And, of course, once Fogel scored, it just turned into one big party. And, you know, again in this game, and, and we'll get to the offside review because that was the biggest moment of the game for me. You know, I didn't see post game the video that any videos the Oilers put out about who gets their um, plunger or anything like that. But you'll remember when Florida went up three to nothing, the the Panthers and it was Matthew Kachuk presented that puck to their team services director who was responsible for getting them to Edmonton on a difficult day of travel. I thought that was an excellent gesture. Well, I would assume, and this pod will come out after everybody knows for sure, that there was a lot of love given by the Oilers to Noah Siegel, who's their video coach, because that was the only time in the game I really felt the Oilers were threatened. You know, when Barkov scored to make it three to one, you know, the other day when in game five, when, when Florida made it four to two, never mind four to three, when Florida made it four to two, I really thought they were going to tie it. I never felt Edmonton was as threatened in this game as they were in game number five. I, I thought they were firmly in control most of the way through, and it, it just struck me as a game that was, aside from the moment of the offside challenge, was a game the Oilers had an excellent grasp of. Um, let, let's make sure in a, in a little bit here, uh, we get back to Noah Siegel because I want to, yeah. I want to do a little bit more on him. Um, he has a fascinating story and there's a point that I want to make about him and video coaches in general, further okay. to the conversation we've had about video coaches this season. Um, but period by period here, Fogel scores that goal. The place erupts. It's one, nothing on an absolutely gorgeous saucer pass made by one of the best passers and one of the best According playmakers. According to the players, one of the, in a row, one of the, the most best passer in the league. Creative players in the game. And he was excellent all first period, as were the Oilers, um, Leon Dreisaitl. Both Leon and the Oilers dominated that first period, Elliot. Yes. Um, you know, look, they, they won uh, comfortably 
in a game where Connor McDavid didn't get a point. Did you have that on your bingo card tonight? Jeff? No, I had uh, Connor, you know, catching uh, catching more Wayne Gretzky records on my bingo card tonight. You're supposed didn't to happen. say yes, of course I knew <laughs> oh, that. Because if you don't yes. take credit for things uh, you didn't do, yes, then was, you're never going to be successful on this planet. Riding a hot um, streak earlier on Thursday, but it's, it, it, I went cold during the game. You know, there were things that Dreisaitl uh, did very well the first few games, but he's judged by production. You know, when you're the, one of the highest paid players on the team and you're as talented as he is, you are paid to score and produce. And you could see it really bothered him. If you've watched any of his media conferences, uh, you could see that he was really upset. He was really disappointed. He wanted to contribute. When they won game four, he made a comment along the lines of back in Florida um, the, that, you know, obviously I was happy that we won the game, but, uh, what this does is it gives me another night to make my imprint on the series and they win game four. And before game six, the morning of game six, he said the same thing. You know, I still have my chance to make an imprint on the series. And he did in the first goal of game number six. And I agree with you. I thought it was his best game, and that's a good sign for the Oilers. To me, there's there's a bunch of different stories about the Oilers. There's McDavid's pursuit of Gretzky, which was temporarily halted in game six. But there's also Stuart Skinner becoming the best closer since Mariano Rivera, unbeaten late in series. Uh, and again, shutting down the Panthers in this one. Uh, the, the save he made on Barkov uh, was a huge save in that second period. And uh, I just think that he looks so calm and looks so under control. The team defense, I thought, was another great story for them. You know, as everybody knows by now, a Panther forward didn't have a shot for 31 minutes. Like, that never happens. When does that ever happen in a game? Um, they, they smothered those guys and they're playing a very disciplined team game. But for me, too, it's, you know, it's it's their other forwards. It's it's the Fogels. It's the Yanmarks. It's the Browns. It's the Henriques. Like those players are the ones, you know, even I would even throw Philip Broberg into there. Those players are the, the cloud. ones. You throw him in, in there? McLeod, yeah, he had a big night. Like, those guys are the guys that have made a significant, as they have risen and their arc has gone up, Edmonton's chances to win have been that much better. So, like, there's no passengers on this Oilers. Like, I think one of the biggest criticisms of the Oilers at times was there were too many passengers. There were too many people along for the ride. There's that that criticism is gone there, and that's a major reason they've come back from three nothing to three three. They've been they've been excellent, and Florida. I'm sure we'll talk about this a bit more, but they're reeling. Uh, and you saw that at the end of the second period specifically, they were reeling and frustrated and didn't know what to do and having a hard time making a pass, and you just saw the frustration boil over. Now. I just Before thought Blad was trying to get a rise out of his team. Of course you know, he was. Th and that's Ryan, what he was trying to do. Ryan Lomberg, yeah. you know, same when deal. It, the same. We all know what they're doing. Like this, this is as old as hockey is. This is as old as rubber pucks and frozen water. Like we, we all know what's going on here. Okay, um, the second period, Adam and Reek scores, and we talked about you know the Leon Dreisaitl sauce pass, a beautiful saucer pass by Matthias Janmark uh, to Adam and Reek there, and I thought that Kevin Bieksa brought up a great point. Uh, he just looks perfect on this Oilers team. Like there's a big decision in the offseason there uh, mm -hmm. with Adam Henrique and the Edmonton Oilers. But before we get to the Hyman breakaway, which made everybody forget about how we used to complain about Zach Hyman skating, he yeah. created se he created separation on that breakaway. We're going to get to that in a second. Let's get to the the Barkoff disallowed goal, the challenge for offside. Now, interestingly enough, in the post game, Paul Maurice said he wouldn't have challenged it. Yep. Based on what he saw, he would not have challenged it. And as you mentioned, um, in a lot of ways, La Première Etoile, as they used to say at the old Montreal Forum, La Première Etoile, the first star of this game in a lot of ways was Noah Siegel, the video coach, who, let me just do a quick little rundown of his, of his background, because when someone like him in his role does something as significant as we saw in game six, you spend a little time there. 
Uh, yep. I, f- I first heard his name as someone who was, you know, to, to keep an eye on who was going to do things in the game um, when he was a director of hockey ops for Canisius College. Now, Canisius College is, you know, just down the street from from where we live, as you know, in, in Buffalo, New York. Also worked as a, a director of hockey ops at University of Vermont, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, well, that's one of it, a lot of people around. The University oh, yeah. Of Vermont's and, a big factory. Yep. Absolutely. Now, one of his more intriguing jobs, and I'd love to talk to him about this, he was head coach in the Pavel Datsuk Hockey School in Russia for like five or six years. What an interesting gig that must have been. Um, was the director of hockey ops at RPI, uh, video coach with the Charlotte Checkers of the American League, Bakersfield Condors, of course, the AHL affiliate for the Edmonton Oilers, and now has this position. One of the early points that you made about video coaches is they're more important than ever and they're under stress all the time. And the one thing that I wondered about Noah Siegel's decision to review the Barkoff goal. And like, we're talking millimeters here. Like, like this is like, like by a hair, is it onside or is it offside here? The thing that I was wondering is how much money do you think Noah saved the Oilers on Friday night? Like if that goal, if that goal counts, well, they don't have any more home games. No, I understand that, but you know what happens. Like if you're you're going to get to the Stanley Cup, like, oh, that I don't, that, I don't even, that I don't could even have think been the this game. Is about money. Hang I on a second here. No, hang on. Money. I do want to make a point about money, though. Oh, okay. Like, like I'd, I'd you, be. Well, you no, know, you're very material. I, I'm talking about winning the Stanley Cup, and you're talking you're, about money. You're the guy that you're just wants to. You're overly materialistic. You're, you're the guy that, that carries a CBA with him everywhere. You're the guy that just wants to talk about salary caps and I don't know. contracts I'm not, I'm not, and all. I'm this. not that materialistic. I don't think about <laughs> money at all. Okay, where are you no, taking me here? So here's where I'm taking you. I think all these people are, are horribly underpaid. I think they're all horribly underpaid. Like I think a top end for a video coach in the NHL to do what Noah does is probably around two hundred thousand dollars. I think he's right around a buck and a quarter. I checked around after that play. I'm like, I wonder how much, like, what is his salary range? And I think it's about like one hundred and twenty-five, somewhere in that neighborhood. And when you consider all the decisions that he's made, and the biggest one on a big stage, Stanley Cup Final Game Six, you make that call. Where we're all looking at it going, and you stick your neck out and you're like, no, that is offside. To me, that's worth a lot more than he is compensated. Well, you're you're right about that. That doesn't count against the cap. And that's true. But I want everyone to know that Jeff is only thinking about money while I'm thinking about winning the Stanley Cup. So understand (laughs) who you want on your team here. Look. There's, there's no question that he made a decision that should give him a significant raise. I, I would completely agree with that with you. Um, the other, because I'll tell you a few things about that moment. I was looking at the replays and I was looking at the referees in the bench, and I'm, I'm with Paul Maurice. I would not have challenged that. I, I wouldn't. I thought it was too close. Like the fans who are around Dave and I are my perch. Like they were looking at the monitor with us. Or those who couldn't see the monitor, they were asking, what do you think? And I'm like, man, that is too close to call. Now, I think one thing that not that really helped Knobloch is the Oilers penalty kill. Because you know that if you if you're wrong, it's two to one and the Panthers are going on the power play. Like one of the things I wondered after that is, does Knobloch challenge that if his penalty kill is at like 64%. Like one of the things I looked up during the game tonight was the Oilers have allowed four power play goals in these playoffs. Um, And they're all at five on four. There are five teams that were eliminated in the first round that gave up more than that. The Islanders gave up five. Edmonton's at four. The Islanders gave up five. Toronto gave up five. Washington gave up five. Winnipeg had six. And LA had seven. Like, what a stat that is. These teams have been gone for almost two months, and they've still given up more five-on-four power play goals than Edmonton has, and Edmonton just finished playing its 25th game of the playoffs. So I looked at that, and I said, Knobloch's got to figure it out. But ultimately, you put your faith in your video coach, right? And you do have to have um, 
uh, big guts to make that decision. No question about it. You have to have big guts to make that decision. And and he did. And like, I'll be honest, I wouldn't have done it. I, I was with Paul Maurice. I was like, to me, that's too close to call. But, you know, obviously, Chris Knobloch has faith in Noah Siegel. And number two, they knew they had that like, fantastic penalty kill that they could lean back on. It was, it was the biggest play of the game. That was Florida's best chance to get back in. It was right after the second goal. Ten it seconds. Was, yeah, Ten it seconds changed later. Momentum. It was the <laughs> one thing that quieted the building all night. Yeah. And when they won that, I just said, they're not losing this one tonight. That, that to me, was the moment uh, the, the game was done. I, I really do believe that. I, I think that two of the biggest momentum swings in the series, Stuart Skinner's save off Carter Verhage in game number four, and and now this one in, in game number six. A few years ago, there was a GM meeting where Steve Eiserman uh, stood up. And obviously, I think Eiserman has a lot of great ideas about the game. And he said that, in his opinion, since we have video review for offside challenges, that the linesman should err on the side of letting the play go on. Unless it's really egregious and they see it, they should blow it dead. But if it's close or they weren't sure, he said we should encourage them to let the play go on. And if it's close, we can review it and take it off. Like that's one of the things I thought about during that play, that that was exactly what Iserman talked about. And I agree with him on that. Don't blow the whistle. Leave it up to the review. Uh, let the players play if you can and leave it up to the coaches to challenge. And I know there were a lot of people who didn't like that challenge. Um, but the fact is you either get all challenges or you get no challenges. And if the call was missed and it was egregious, everybody would be screaming bloody murder that this goal counted. So this is the system we got. And I like the fact that even on a, on a play as close as that one, it was allowed to play out and be reviewed that way because I do think that's the way it should be done. I think Eisman was 100% right about that. By the way, talking about m money, I someone told me that the revenues, and I'm talking about gross revenues, not net, for Edmonton's home game tonight would have been enormous like i heard game four was a massive number mm -hmm. yeah, like one of the me. biggest nights in the history of the nhl so i gotta you, think game six was even bigger if you are an nhler who is not in the playoffs you are loving this yes because this goes into hrr but there you go yes. thinking about the money again elliot and i'm just yeah well you put Stanley it in my Cup head dreams. because you're I'm very materialistic and i'm happy to live off the earth and be a communist. Everybody in their Edmonton Oiler jammies having dreams of Game 7. Yeah. And who's Connor going to pass it to? Uh, I want to mention Zach Hyman as well. 16th goal of the playoffs, 70th of the season. It's a breakaway blocking a Gustav Forsling shot, and then he is off to the races. And the one thing that I couldn't help but notice, much like the Connor Brown shorthanded goal, he took Bobrovsky from right to left and stretched yeah, second him Second game in a row. I don't know if that is a thing. I don't know. But I just saw, hmm, maybe there's something there. I don't know. Barkov does score uh, in the third period, pretty early in the third as well, making it 3-1. to one. And then there was a pair of empty net goals, McLeod and Darnell Nurse. Um, on a great play, on a great, on a great play by Stuart Skinner to get him the yeah. puck as well. It's uh, that was a great save, and it's very rare that you do see goalies being part of the goal celebration. But that was a nice touch, I thought, celebrating around Stuart Skinner. Twenty saves for Stuart Skinner in this one, and like just flat out, bluntly, he is outperforming Sergei Bobrovsky. Full Every, stop. I, I, I'm going to go on the plane, but to uh, on the on the plane to Florida on Sunday. Or Saturday. I don't even know what day it is anymore. Saturday. No. I'm going to go back and listen to the pod after game three and just laugh at how much stuff we, we got wrong. And well, how much everything Elliot, has changed they since were, then. They were, not that we were wrong. Like, we were right about how much Florida was dominating the Edmonton. No, Oilers we were and how this was, oh, well, well, ultimately, yes, because who, <laughs> okay, but, but, but here's the thing about this. I'm glad you took us there because the one thing that's so great about this right now like, I don't care that it's Edmonton. It could be anybody. This could be all reverse, and I'd still say the same thing. This is great. 
You know why? Because stuff like this doesn't happen in hockey because hockey's really hard. That's why you don't get like a lot of Cinderella stories and you don't get like miracle stories like this. Sure, there was 1980, right? And I think that's what makes 1980 so special because these things don't happen. Hockey's hard. The playoffs are hard. How many times have you seen? I mean, Elliot, we're kids of the 80s. For 78 I mean, years, Jeff. It's the first time in 78 years a team yeah. was 3 nothing down. We got to game seven. Now they lost that one. Uh, that was Detroit, and and they'll hope, and the Panthers will hope to write a different history. But like you said, this doesn't this doesn't happen often. This doesn't you know, happen. What? Hang on, you know, hang on. We're kids of the '80s. Yeah. How many true. times did we see a team, like a miracle team, get to the Stanley Cup final, only to get squashed? There was Vancouver against the Islanders. There was. Um, Minnesota Chicago, against the Islanders. Minnesota. Like, how many times did we saw this over and over and over again? And even in the nineties, there was there was Florida and Colorado. Yeah, nineteen ninety six squash. Like there was Washington and Detroit squash. squash. Philadelphia Detroit. Squash. Yeah, but Philadelphia I thought was actually a better team. They were like, they were a good team, and it was Legion. Like of you, Doom. you you were looking at them like they deserve to be in the final. Like we but were like, looking at our first sweep. Yeah. in almost 30 years and now yeah. we're going to game seven detroit washington someone said to me sent me a note tonight they said this is the first post-covid game seven in any league championship in any league i mean you would know yeah. better than i would really eh yeah uh i think it's fantastic i i really do i do I, again just like, i know just it's because... been really spread out and i know it's driving people crazy uh, but you know, the thing is, like, people say to you, say to me, aren't, aren't you, like, isn't this too long? For me, when I'm caught up in the middle of it, I love every second of it. I don't, I understand how people out there who aren't covering it like we are, like, they, they it, it makes them bananas. And I, I, I heard some teams are really unhappy about it. But for me, right in the middle of it, I, I don't know. I, I love it. And uh, I'm, uh, I can't wait till game seven. I, I'm really excited. I, I have like I always say momentum doesn't exist in the playoffs. It sure exists right now. Like who who's stopping this gigantic snowball coming down the hill? And, and you know that's the thing like we talked about it during the game. You know the the Panthers it, it, the, when they lost game 4, it was like whatever, blip. Like we just went over a speed bump and we're going home and I think everybody understood that. When they lost game five, you know, I, even I was like, uh-oh, like this this could become a real problem. And I thought Matthew Kachuk had a great message when he arrived in Edmonton. He said, look, if you would have told us at the beginning of the year, we're up three to two in the Stanley Cup final, he would have taken it. And I was like, that's good. That, that's the good mentality. But then they lose this game. And and to be honest, I like I said, at the moment that Edmonton won that challenge, I, I really felt that they were going to win the game. I, I didn't think Florida really threatened them. And now you're going home three all, and you're like, okay, what are we pulling out of the, uh, of the bag of tricks, the the mental bag of tricks to win this? Now, you know, one of the things that I think about in life, and for the most part, I've been like this in the last thirty years, is that I have a rule: no matter what I'm upset about uh, in a day, when I wake up the next day, it's over. And for the most part, I really do adhere to that. Okay, new day, new challenge, new thing. And that's the thing I would say is that if I was playing in Florida, you know, hey, well, first of all, if I was playing for the Panthers, they would never make the Stanley Cup final. But if I was playing for Florida, I would be like, I still have a chance to win the cup on Monday night. But you can see it on them. Like, it is it is really wearing on them. And so you have to sell them on. You can still win the Stanley Cup. You can still find a way to win. Now, the things that, you know, concern me about this, they're, you know, they're – I, they're giving up a lot of breakaways. You know, that's that's number one. You know, one of the things one of the Oilers told me after game three was the, they, they said to each other, no more freebies. Like, you'll remember they lost game three when all of their mistakes ended up in their own net, including three of them in six minutes that basically decided the game. And they just said, like, no more freebies. No more. And, you know, they've played really good defense. And if they're in trouble... 
like they they get rid of the puck and they create races and stuff like that. Like they're playing very smart and very safe. And I think that's really eliminated things, but they're getting a lot of breakaways. They're really frustrating um, Florida. And the other thing, you know, Florida's power play is, is doing nothing there. You know, one player has been texting me saying they just don't have enough one timer options. He, uh, he feels with Florida, but the other thing too, is like, I think Kachuk has given them really good moments at times. I think Barkov is giving them really good moments at times, you know, Ekblad, I really thought tried to drag them into the fight, but some of their other players like Reinhardt's been very quiet. You know, Verhicke didn't skate on Friday morning and he has really struggled. Like he's fumbled around with the pocket times. It makes me wonder if he's dealing with something, but he's a really important player for them who's gone uh, a really quiet. And I think that's the thing. I think, you know, and, and we talked about this before with some of the Oilers that struggled. At this time of year, you can always rewrite your narrative and you can always rewrite your legacy. You've got to, you've got to sell these guys on. You have one game to rewrite your legacy here. And, and that's what I would be doing. And I would still say, I would say this to the Oilers too, no matter what you think, no matter what's happened, you're playing for the Stanley Cup on Monday night, and that is enough to make you feel really good. The other thing I would think about for the Florida Panthers is, and I always remember this, I go back to 2003, and it was New Jersey Anaheim, and New Jersey was rotating as their final defenseman, Ken Danico and Oleg Tevardovsky. And Scott Stevens went to Pat Burns the day before Game 7, and he said, we would like Danico in the lineup. We, we would like him in. And, you know, I, I look at this and I would just wonder if, like a Pozo, like you, you, you put him back in, you know, Cousins was quiet. You know, I, I don't want to pick on Cousins because there's been a whole hockey night cousin things, Cousins thing this year. And I, this is not that. I, I don't want anyone to think this is that. Um, I, I just, I, I would look at a Pozo and say, you know, for him to see him with a chance, one last chance to win the cup, I think unless you really think he can't give it to you, I'd want him out there. It reminds me of Danico in 2003. I I know Danico was a lifelong devil, like Pozo's new, but everybody knows what he's about, Jeff. I, I, just from outside, I think I'd want that there. Don't disagree do you with think? you at all. Uh, what do you no, think? I, w- I would put him in even just to look down the bench and see like this is his last shot. Because at this point, you're looking for inspiration from anywhere. This is it. This is the no tomorrow last game at the final buzzer. Um, this game's over and we're all leaving and only one team is going to be leaving happy. You need to find inspiration wherever you can, whether it's... Uh, the fans, whether it's a player, it's something emotional, it's something that Paul Maurice says to you before the game. I think you need anything and everything at that moment. And if it means here's Kyle Poso and you don't get many shots to win the Stanley Cup and this is his shot to win the Stanley Cup, I don't know. Is that worth extra juice for a lot of guys? I certainly hope it would be. Just like a lot of those guys on the Colorado Avalanche looked at Ray Bork. And said, yeah, we want to win yeah, the cup one. and we want to win the cup for that guy. That guy who's going to the Hockey Hall of Fame. That guy that's been around forever. That guy. In, like Honestly, for a game like this, wherever you can get a little bit of extra juice, I think you do it. I absolutely think you do it. And I, and it's not like Kyle Post was going out there and showing that he can't play. He can still play. He can still play hockey. Right? Like he's still like a good member of this team. He still fulfills a role. I'm with you. I put Akposo back all day long. I put him back all day long, Elliot. Monday's going to be, and for Oilers, don't change a thing. Not a no, thing. No, you can't. I mean, I, I know Evander Kane is, is I ready, know, but that, I don't, th- I don't think saying. you can do it. No, nope. I, I don't think you can do it. Uh, Not a thing. I, I, I really don't. Everything's going great. Eyes on Monday. We can't wait. We suspect you are the same. Okay, so Elliot, from uh, dreaming about a Game 7 to the news of the day and the news leading into the weekend, we'll start with the Winnipeg Jets and what is happening with first-round draft pick Rutger McGordy. So I'm going to be really careful here, Jeff, because there's a lot of answers I don't have 
his family advisor is not talking and the Jets are not talking. But the one thing I can tell you is that I have heard his name has come up in trade discussions. That the Jets have discussed trading and other teams have discussed acquiring McGordy's rights. Now, you'll remember uh, a few months ago after the NCAA season, McGordy announced he was going back to Michigan for his junior year. And the Jets have his rights for two more years. And again, I'm not going to guess on anything here. I'm simply going to say I have heard that his name has come up in trade conversations. So we'll see where all this goes over the next couple of weeks. He's a good player, and he would be coveted. He would. Um, And there is a uh, certain event called the NHL Draft on the horizon, and the Winnipeg Jets do not have a first-round pick in said draft. I just wonder how much... How much spicier action at the Sphere got next Friday in in Vegas? We'll see when we get there. Um, Okay, so from Rutger McGordy, let's go to the Arizona Coyotes. And we thought that in the not-too-distant future, um, next week, um, that the Arizona Coyotes um, would win an auction and find a new home for their rink and entertainment facility. Uh, But the Arizona State Land Department Uh, put an end to that, at least temporarily, and canceled the land auction. Now, the Arizona Coyotes were swift uh, to issue a statement about it, um, saying, amongst other things, that they have been working in good faith with the Arizona State Land Department and have been on track to win the auction. And then this suddenly got reversed on Friday, essentially pulling the rug out from under the feet of Alex Morello and the Arizona Coyotes. Um, According to Craig Morgan, an Arizona council person saying, the Coyotes need to get a zoning attorney. The Coyotes need a quote, special use permit to move forward. And one of the things that Morgan does uh, question as well, you know, in the statement that the Arizona Coyotes put out there, they didn't say anything about whether they would try to continue um, to get this piece of land, choosing rather to say they were exploring legal options. I'm assuming you're not a fan of the story, Elliot. You know what, Jeff? I have decided. (laughs) So today I saw Craig's tweet. I was like, oh, man, I feel sorry for that guy. He still has to deal with this. And then you know what? It it hit me. I I don't care about this story anymore. I, I, I just don't. I looked at the Coyote statement, and I was like, you know that meme that says, I ain't reading all that? I'm happy for you though, or sorry that happened. Like that, that's what's came into my head. I was like, I, I can't be bothered to chase this story anymore. It, what do we know? We know that Alex Morello must deliver his reactivation notice no later than December 31st, 2027. For it to be granted, the new arena must be at least 50% complete. Uh, I reported that. Uh, back on uh, April 20th, and I've made sure to keep that note. So I knew, like on days like today, how to reference it. And to me, Jeff, like, wake me up when we're there. You know, I I want to say one thing. Every time this happens, I really feel for the employees whose lives were disrupted by this and all of this insanity. But I you know, someone said to me, are you going to look into this story? And I was like, no. For one thing, it's game six of the Stanley Cup final. I care more about that. And two, like, I was like, I- I'm done with this. Like, just just tell me when Arizona's getting another team or if Morello is going to meet his deadline. It, it, I- I'm not chasing this anymore. I am, I am done with this. Stop so you, trying to make fetch happen. Stop trying to make fetch happen. It's not going to happen. You <laughs> felt very, very hip reference. So yeah, you feel today. you feel bad for Craig Morgan for still having to chase this story. Yes. I feel bad for fans there that keep getting their hearts crushed. Like there's going to be a viewing party for this, for the auction. Like oh, how many how how many times can you get your heart stomped? If well, you're I, I, Arizona think, I think Coyotes what you fan? should do 
is you should do what I do. Not and care? just say, no, 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 <laughs> like check out until Morello's date is passed. Or, no, I'm no, I'm gonna no, yes. I, I gotta stay. No, I gotta stick with it. I'm gonna read every tweet that Craig puts oh out. I'm gonna read God. everything. Yes, no, I'm going to. I don't care how long it takes, dude. I was there. I was there in the courtroom. Judge Redfield, T bomb, like all of it. Keys on the table, the whole deal. Bankruptcy. I was there for. I can't stop now. So you I'm, have some I'm issues deep. here. First of all, you only care about money, <laughs> and secondly, you're way too invested in this story. <laughs> what do we all know? We all know that once Morello is out of the picture, they're going back there. Yeah, I know. So, I, you know, it's all you can do is you can, like, you, I, you're right. People get their heartstrings pulled and it shouldn't happen. The only thing you can do is check out until this is over. And that's the way I look at it now. Meanwhile, Elliot, um, before we get to uh, some of the news from earlier on this week, on Thursday, we had a conversation on the radio about the future of Linus Allmark and the Boston Bruins. I think there's a couple of points here um, that we should probably sharpen the pencil on as well. Uh, the nature of the no trade, uh, the nature of perhaps an extension coming along with um, waiving the no trade to go to certain markets. How do you look at the Linus Allmark Boston situation? I think the extension you mentioned there is a very big part of this. Like, I think the reports of Ottawa and Boston discussing an Allmark trade are very true. Um, you know, I, I think it's taken on added urgency because Markstrom is now off the board. Um, Darcy Kemper is now off the board. And also a team that was looking for a goalie, the Kings, are now out of the picture. So in addition to... You know, just the fact that Otto was looking for a goalie, and I think Boston would like to move Allmark, the, the number of dance partners, it's like last dance at the prom. If you didn't come with a date, you want to make sure you find somebody to dance with, right? And so we're at, we're kind of getting to that stage now. I thought Steve Eiserman in his pre-draft availability he had it on friday and he said something very interesting about like we'd heard detroit was in the goalie market and he confirmed that but he did make a point of saying i'm not looking for someone who's going to be here for two or three years and then leave i thought that was a very interesting quote we know toronto's in on the goalie market um but uh, I think that's more of a Brassois, Anthony Stolars type piece. Now that they, um, I think they, I heard their offer to uh, Calgary was comparable uh, to New Jersey's, but I think because of all the politics there, I think Toronto was going to have to blow anyone else out of the water to get that player. I also think Markstrom at the end of the day preferred New Jersey most, but you know, he opened it up to teams like Toronto and Ottawa in the Eastern Conference. But I, I think the Maple Leafs were really going to have to win that deal. But look, now you've got a situation where Boston's looking and saying, oh boy, like how many other places are reasonably going to be looking at goaltenders that we can send Allmark to? And Ottawa's got to be looking around and, and saying, okay, what else is available? There's Allmark. Um, there's John Gibson. I don't even know if that's possible to work out or how Ottawa feels about that. Allmark's no trade list dropped from 16 last year to 14 this year. And the thing you really have to talk about, Jeff, is the way agents and players shape this. It's not as simple as saying, take the 14 places I hate the most and put them on the list. It's also, it's also strategic in the sense that they'll go look for it and they'll say, well, this team doesn't need a goalie. We could get traded to this team that needs a goalie. So how do we feel about it? And if we don't like it, we better make sure that team's on the list. Like a lot of these lists are very strategic about who's going to want you that you may not want to go to. So, you know, Ottawa, I believe, is on the list. Um, but one of the things I've really heard here, Jeff, is that if you're going to pay the price that Boston is asking, which is a big price, are you going to be comfortable with Allmark as a rental or are you going to want to have an extension in place? And then that leads to two problems. Number one, would Allmark want to extend there? And number two, would Allmark, can you got, can two sides make a deal that both say Ottawa and Allmark 
would be happy with. And I, from what I've heard, that's going to be a challenge. Like, I do think New Jersey looked at Allmark too, in addition to Markstrom, and I think that was a challenge there as well. Markstrom has two years left, so it's a little less of a concern. But I think that was an issue. And, you know, one of the things about uh, last year with L.A. and whatever happened there, um, you know, I don't think Allmark was crazy about relocating his family during the season. I think he was more open to a fresher scenario now as opposed to in the middle of the year where his family was not affected. However, I think now the extension becomes as big a concern for everybody involved if the price is high. Now, the other thing that could happen to Jeff, because there seem to be less dance partners, I wonder if Boston's going to feel pressure to come down on its price. Like there's... You know, like like this Iserman quote, like if he's interested in Allmark, that says to me he wants Allmark with an extension. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised at that whatsoever from Steve Iserman. Maybe I would be mildly surprised about trading within the division. Maybe I put more on that than than other people. But would well, that be a concern Ottawa's if you're Don Sweeney? Ottawa's, Ottawa's in, in the, the same. So I you know. get you, as long as you get your price, you make the deal. Like, Berkey was a big guy like that. He didn't like the idea of trading a goalie within the division. Brian Murray did it with Ben Bishop. Um, but if you get the price you want, you make the deal. The only thing, that is the one position I always get a little bit squirmy about. Uh, normally, I'm a ah, within the division, not a, not a big deal, except for goalies. That's the only one, and maybe that's that bit of like old school thinking I need to get out of my brain, but I still have it, um, specifically for goaltenders. Speaking of goaltenders. But, but, but like if you, look, if you look out there now, aside from Allmark, who's, who's, who's out there? There's Gibson. You know, Anaheim would move him, but they really don't want to eat money. I know Don Waddell. that deal. Don Waddell has talked about, you know, no one's taking the contract, but Elvis uh, Can Merzlikens. I talk about that for a second? You of know course. what I think that is? That is a shot from Don Waddell across the bow of Elvis Merzlikens. Of course it is. Totally. That, and, that and, and, was, and he, that he, was he a can, challenge. Yeah. And he Don can, Waddell he can, came in, cowboy yeah. boots up to his neck. <laughs> and he's like, Elvis, I'm coming right at you. It's gonna be a fascinating time for the uh, for the Columbus Blue Jackets. There's that. There's the Patrick Line situation as well. Uh, mm -hmm. There's who's there's who's gonna be the coach. If you have a thought on that one, uh, Elliot. As Somebody well, like, told me really to pump the brakes on Patrick Line too. Like they just said, like there's a lot of conversations that have to happen here first. Slow slow down on that one. I was told, and I, obviously, I think we're all very sensitive to what what he's going through but look like uh, aside from that like there are very good like uh options available like the brassois and the stolars of the world but i think everybody's kind of wondering like what's like if you're looking for a, a number one goalie you've got all mark you've got gibson and who else is available now so you know the the challenge becomes even greater, especially with Allmark's no trade and potential extension or non-extension playing a role in all of this. Speaking of goaltenders, uh, the big goalie news of the week. Um, surprise, surprise, the New Jersey Devils got Jacob Markstrom. Uh, it's only been something we've been talking about for a number of months. 31% um, yeah. retention, Kevin Ball, and a protected first-round pick in 2025 goes the other way. Um, it took a long time, but it got there. Um, how did you look at this deal when it was finally completed? You know, I had to say initially, I was like, "That seems pretty light." Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll say that when I when I heard the return, and then you know, someone sent me to look at it, and uh, I mentioned it on your show. So, Marsham is thirty four, and you just look at the trade returns for thirty year old goalies, and I went back about fifteen years. So, Darcy Camper was thirty one years old in twenty twenty one when he got traded from Arizona to Colorado and he got a first rounder, Ryan Miller was 33 years old in 2014 when he was traded from Buffalo to St. Louis. He got a first rounder and Markstrom's the only the third, like there's only three of them in the last 15 years who were 30 years old and got a first rounder. And Markstrom's the oldest. He was, he's 34. He was older than Kemper and Miller. So, 
and you know the thing is now that teams are becoming more sophisticated at this stuff they all have lists and you know what that is it's a reminder of me to always check the market because like i said when i first heard i was like "Ooh, that seems light and then you know a couple teams said to me ain't that light i mean it may not look spectacular but it fits with what has happened and so Calgary told teams they wanted a, a, a first rounder and they wanted a player they could put on their roster right away. And so they got it. Um, you know, Markstrom did them a favor. He uh, he told them that he would open up the search a bit more. It was last year it was only New Jersey. Uh, this year he put more teams in. Now, I heard that initially he had it open to everybody, but then he kind of said, you know what, I'm 34 years old. It, it will really benefit me to be in the Eastern Conference with the better travel. So th they went East and uh, they got the first rounder from New Jersey. They got Kevin Ball. Um, you know, Kevin Ball is never going to score a ton of points, but I had a few people who really said good things about him. First of all, they say he's got a great attitude. Secondly, he's 23 years old. He's already come a long way in a pretty short time. And, um, you know, like you need bulk in this league. And, uh, you know, the thing that a couple of people said to me is he's really, he's really willing to work. Like if you work with him or he'll do it. And, you know, the, the flames had Zadorov, and I don't like, like, I don't think he's ever going to have the personality of Zadorov, but I do think that they, and a couple of, I checked with a couple of teams and they said, yeah, the, the statistical profile is kind of there. Um, that, you know, I, I don't know if he's ever going to be as ferocious a hitter as he is, but he's a big body uh, who knows how to use it, isn't afraid to use it, and has a really willing work ethic. Like, there's a player there. And, you know, it, it's up to Calgary now. Calgary's got a lot of defensemen, a lot of young defensemen. It's up to Calgary now to develop these players properly. It's it's in their hands. But it's it's a fair return for what goalies get. And, you know, they ultimately they wanted a first and a prospect and they got it. I'd love to know what Toronto's package was because I heard it was – the word I got was comparable. I don't know what Ottawa offered, but ultimately I think Ball and the first – um, and like, I, I can't imagine New Jersey is going to be picking in the top 10 in 2025. So I assume it's a 2025 instead of an unprotected 26. But, you know, they got what they wanted. Uh, I, I spoke to Tom Fitzgerald on the uh, on the radio show a couple of days ago and, and asked him about uh, Markstrom, obviously, and the nature of the New Jersey Devils blue line. Try to make the point that, you know, having a goaltender is only part of it here. You still need to do something with the blue line. And he said, like, yeah, we, we still need we still need veteran guys back there. You know, um, you know the some of the injuries to the back end, Dougie Hamilton, Jonas Siegenthaler, that opened the door for Simon Nemec, et cetera. But he said, like, look, we we still need to have more experience back there. So I don't think this is, I don't think the New Jersey Devils are closed for business at all, Elliot. I still think that they're, I still think they're out there looking. I think a lot of people, to be honest, I suspect with you, they're one of the teams in on Pesci. Uh, w would not surprise me at all. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, to your previous point about it, the, the deal looks a little bit light. I thought Flames fans were thinking about an Alexander Holst or maybe a Dawson Mercer, these types of players. I, 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 like, I heard the Mercer rumors, and I said, like, to me, if Mercer's in that deal, if you're Calgary, you run to the oh, fax yeah. machine and get that done fax like, machine <laughs> do not go what year do not, is it <laughs> do not pass go do not collect two hundred dollars you run you run to the to whatever you have to do to send it and you sign it mm -hmm. um you know but I, I, I to me like i mean who knows like the you know I, like i asked and people said mercer was never in it and or at least maybe they asked about it but like it wasn't he wasn't in the deal. Like to me, it was just if if New Jersey was willing to trade Dawson Mercer for Jacob Markstrom, if you're a Calgary, you 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 do not let Fitzgerald off the phone. Like that one always seemed weird to me. You yeah. know, I wonder is it possible? Un 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 unless it was part mm -hmm. of a bigger deal. That's what I always come back to. Like I wonder about okay. going back to last year. Like if like Noah Hannafin is part of something, then we're getting bigger names. That's what yeah. I'm okay. About. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't think it's like a one for one like that is what I, that's a fair yeah. point, Merrick. But like, to me, I would wonder if, uh, Calgary thought higher of ball than Holtz. 
for what I don't they know need, the answer to that, but for for what they need, big defensemen that can defend. It's it's not impossible to me. I don't know. I want people to. I want to stress that. I don't know about many things. I don't know about this, but it's not impossible to me that Calgary thought higher of ball than Holtz. Okay, a couple of other things here. Um, I know we've all had a, a couple of days to discuss it, but um, for the purposes of this podcast, um, and we're going to talk about it a little bit later on in the thought line, but Pierre-Luc Dubois for Darcy Kemper. The goalie goes to L.A., the big-bodied center goes to Washington. There's a lot of layers to this one. Oh, As yes. I mentioned to you the other day, I think a lot of this is about Quinton Byfield and opening up not just a spot, but cap yeah, space but, as well. People told me you're nuts, by the way. Oh, okay. Well, that's fine. Let's see You've what happens with the Byfield deal. You've had a lot of good ideas deals. this week yeah. and some good ones on this pod. That's, you don't think you don't you don't good. think you don't think the part of this is opening up a space for a spot no. for Quinton Byfield, the I most improved player all... in the NHL last year. I, I don't disagree with anything you just said there, except that I think this is all about Dubois. They couldn't come back with him. They couldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to say something about Rob Blake, too. Rob Blake could have buried Dubois, buried him on the way out. Yep, and he, he didn't. didn't do that. He took it on twice, he said. It was an organizational, he didn't use the word failure. But he'd said the organization deserves the responsibility for the fact that this didn't work. Like, I, I give Rob Blake a lot of credit for that. He didn't, even, he didn't have it. He could have, must he just have said been it was, so tempting, Elliot. He, he could have said it was just time to move on. He could have buried the guy. He had, he had, it was choose your own adventure. He had three forks in the road and he, and he took the one that put the spotlight most on him. Like, I got a lot of respect for that. I, I really do. But I think this was all about Dubois and the realization that this was not going to work. And, and you know, in L.A., you know, there could be jobs on the line now. So, like, you have to put yourself in the best position to succeed. And I think they just felt like, and I'll say this too about Blake. So someone called me yesterday and they said, there's a story here about how much effort Blake put in to Dubois and then he goes but I'm not telling you it I'm like what is the point of this phone call <laughs> so like I like I believe that Blake, I like hang on I like that people call you just to put some cheese in the trap and then yeah, hang up no, I like that it's, it's I like so that. infuriating it happens way too I, I said, love it. I said Please I'm not do it. very do it more I, I'm people. like do it my more. response to this is I'm not very bright and I don't like to work hard. So please just spell it right out for me. <laughs> but, you know, they, they said that, you know, Blake made Dubois like a real personal project during the year to try to get the best out of him. And I just think like, this was all about they just felt it wasn't going to work. Now, one of the things I think that happened with Washington is, and I'll say this too, I, I want to make this very clear. I heard from a pretty good source also that Washington was not the only team in on this. That yeah. there were other teams who were legitimately interested in Dubois. Do you want me to give you two predictions? I don't know. These are predictions. My 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 one prediction because it's a big bodied center, so I'll naturally default to Boston. Yeah, that would be I one of my predictions. One of okay. I do think that's one of them. I think the second one. I actually thought you were going to guess the second one. Because I think it's obvious. Montreal? Yes. I do. Hmm. I, I, this is, I, like, I haven't asked. These are my guesses. I think that Boston, because I heard, I legitimately heard there were at least two other teams in there. And Boston, I think you, you, you gave the rationale there very well. I think Montreal was interested too because Montreal has long had an interest in Dubois. I don't, before anyone even asks or X's at me, I have no idea about what the returns could have been, but I heard there were other teams involved and those were the first two teams I thought of. Like, I don't think this was the only deal that LA could have made. Now, I think they were determined to get a goalie. We all know that. They know Kemper. Uh, look, Kemper had a really rough year in Washington. I'll say this too. I had some people around the Capitals say good things about Kemper that, you know, early in the year, uh, Carberry brought in the man-to-man -man D and they got lit up a few nights 
And Kemper took the brunt of that. Like he got lit up early in the season because they were figuring out how to play and he didn't cause them a lot of problems. Like Kemper ate some really tough games last year early on. And he, they, they said very good things about him. And, you know, the Kings are obviously a more lock it down defensive team. And, you know, Blake says they're going to change some of that, but generally the Kings play pretty well defensively. And I think Kemper will take, get the benefit of that. The other thing, and I talked about this with you on your show is that Washington has a good record with first rounders that didn't pan out elsewhere. Um, oh, she's a bit different, but we all know St. Louis wasn't hundred percent happy with him, but let's talk Strom. Let's talk Sonny Milano. Um, you know, they, that was one of the reasons, but to me, this is all on Dubois. He has got to figure this out. Um, like, like at some point in time, everybody else can put you in a position to be successful. Everybody else can say, we believe we can be the difference maker in this person's attitude or environment that makes them better. At the end of the day, it's all about you. You decide, look, sometimes you need luck. Sometimes things happen that are out of your control, but far more often than not, we determine the success of our outcomes in our lives. And, you know, when LA was signing him, there were people that warned them not to do it. And a year later, they're making this trade. It's up to Dubois now to take control of his destiny and prove that he can be the player that everybody thinks he can be. It's also a big comment on not just Charlie Lindgren, because that's the obvious one, and he had a wonderful season for the, the yeah. Washington Capitals, and he's been great, but Hunter Shepard as well. And now Hershey is tied with Coachella Valley in their best of seven, 2-2, two, two. Yeah. Um, and he's been real good. I know you've gone out of your way to mention Clay Stevenson as well, Elliot. Yeah. So like yeah. coming up here, like there's some there's some good goalies on the horizon for the Washington Capitals. That has to be part of this. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that too. I think they, they have goalie depth. There's 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 no question about it. What would be interesting is if it's Lindgren and Hunter Shepard next year, that would be unusually small for an NHL goaltending combination. While, while this goalie coach from another team said they like both those guys, so they're not the biggest guys. And what do we always say about big goaltenders? You get accidental saves, and everybody likes well, a good accidental save. It's true. You know, you were talking about Dubois. You had your tweet about big big guys always get more chances. So yeah, the, do you uh, remember? This, this, do you remember this, an NBA center named Mark Eaton? I don't. I don't know the NBA so, as well as you do. That's true. So uh, Mark Eaton played for the Utah Jazz, mm -hmm. and he was seven foot three and he didn't play a lot in college, but the Jazz drafted him. And Frank Layden, who was their general manager at the time, was asked about the pick and he said, You can't teach height. Uh, and, I've heard that quote before, yeah. Yeah. Mark Eaton turned into a block machine in mm -hmm. the NBA, a very effective player. Not an offensive player at all, but a very, very effective defender and a key part of some very good jazz teams the uh the quote that elliot is referencing um it's an old saying and it goes like this a small player has to prove he can play while a big player has to prove that he can't that has been the history of the nhl and i would imagine too elliot probably a lot of other sports who's who's kidding who I yeah mean, you go to you go to you go look at you know major league baseball prospects if you're not six foot three they're not having to look at you either um jeff they told me size didn't matter they lie. <laughs> oh, it's true. Uh, the Barclay Goodrow situation. I want to focus on a couple of moves by San Jose this week here as we sort of wrap up the news segment. Um, Barclay Goodrow placed on waivers by the New York Rangers um, and claimed by the San Jose Sharks, um, as we had discussed. Um, not exactly a surprise, although maybe the Goodrow camp was surprised by the timing of this. At the end of the day, Jeff, I think this will all work itself out. Like Barkley Goodrow, he's he's a good pro, and he's a good pro. He, he's going to make a lot of money, and you're going to make the best of it. I just think for Goodrow, it's just 
he, I, I think he just felt he deserved, we talked about it a lot in your show, he deserved more of a courtesy. Um, like, I, like, Chris Drury has to run his organization as he sees fit. His job is to win a Stanley Cup. Mike Greer is to, is his job is to run his organization as he sees fit. His job is to build a team around Eklund and Will Smith and Celebrini and maybe Mark Giordano too, who's still looking to play. Um, be a, as you said, could be a perfect shark. And one of the things that happened too is that Greer, he knows like there's been like there's been reports about Atkinson, Cam Atkinson, not uh, not allowing a trade to San Jose. Like Mike Greer, he's got to, at some point in time you have to stand up for your franchise and say, you know what? I have an opportunity to get this player. I'm getting this player. I have to do it for my young players, and I have to do it for the vision of this organization. I have to do what's best for the Sharks. I understand that. I just think Goudreau would have preferred more of a heads up that this was a possibility. Now, I'll say this. One team did tell me that they are going to wonder. Remember, you told the story on the last pod about the NHL and that whole Marchand for Fedorov trade and oh know, boy, yeah. kind of looked into Columbus, it. Columbus, Anaheim. Like, <laughs> yeah, like we want to make sure there's nothing fishy here. One team did tell me that they'll be curious to see if there's any trades between the Sharks and the, and the Rangers because, you know, they did get around his no trade clause, right? And he did say that is something both the union and the league and therefore the league will be on top of but you know like i said it was it was a tough it was a tough thing for goodrow to go through um uh he wanted more of a heads up but i think in the long run it's all gonna sort itself out like like i said he's a pro and you know it's good money um you know i had a lot of people sending me the mad men uh gif of don draper yelling at uh, Elizabeth Moss, that's what the money is for. It's actually one of my favorite scenes ever in any TV show or movie anywhere. And I think we'll eventually get to that. But in the moment, um, I can understand Good Rose emotion. I think it came as a really sure. big shock to him. Um, speaking of the San Jose Sharks, um, Ty Delandria goes from Dallas to San Jose, a fourth round pick going the other way. You know, this one is interesting. Uh, I've mentioned to you this week that it, it sounds to me and, and feels to me very much like this is setting up other moves um, for the Dallas Stars. You had talked about the Stars taking a good run at Chris Tanev this week. Uh, yeah. Try to bring him back. Matt yep. Deshane. Uh, there's yep. a desire on both sides for a fit. Yeah. Um, you know, Maverick Bork is going to play full time with Dallas next year. Where's that ice time going to come from? So it seems sort of destined that they were going to have to do something with Delandria, and this is it. Yeah, it'll give him an opportunity to play. There's no doubt about that. As I mentioned on your show, too, I, I think there's a suspicion that Dallas has interest in William Carrier. Um, so, and, you know, I've forgotten he played for DeBoer, so DeBoer knows knows him very well from his time in Vegas and he's he's perfect for the way uh Dallas plays. Um I do think they're really trying hard to keep Tanev. I still think they're very interested in Duchesne. You know, but Dallas, you know, again like we've been talking about why Johnson extension, Jake Ottinger extension, and Thomas Harley too. I I hadn't even mentioned him. So those uh they, they got some dancing to do i think jim neal is one of the guys who said you can run out of your space really quickly um yeah. but, i think there's uh, more deals like honestly i, yeah. I think that there's more coming i really do um someone told me too that washington is not done they think washington's going to be very busy they think really eh? well yeah 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 they they there there's some more there i i, I wonder if they like i i really wonder about them i I heard there's more coming there. I'll tell something else too is, I you know depending on what happens in Vancouver with all these other things that they're working on, I wonder if Tyler Toffoli is back on Vancouver's radar. Really? Yes. Yes. Uh, I thought it's it was Jake Gensler. I thought it was Jake Jake Gensler bust. 
Well, I mean, in case you bust, you actually have to have a plan, <laughs> right? Like I, I've heard, and and, huh. and and I could see Toffoli being a guy who's on the Rangers' radar too, with the money that they got now. For sure, by, for sure. But with Gar, with Goudreau off, so. But I, I, I wondered about Toffoli in Vancouver this week. They know him, and uh, that's another name that popped into my head. Keep that in mind. All right. Oh, by the, the break. way, oh. b- before we before we do the break here, Jeff, I had to say we talked about Detroit a little bit, so I yeah. couldn't watch Iserman's availability because it was during the the morning skate. And but I read about it after, and I'm lifting this quote from Sean Shapiro's column. He did a good summary of what Iserman said, and I almost died laughing when I read this. For the draft itself, Iserman prefers the war room setup that will take over next year when the teams will be decentralized. He doesn't like the current setup with all the teams on the floor. Said it makes it feel like everyone is spying. There is no better Iserman quote than that one. Everyone is spying on me. For the for the new Lou, as we like to call, <laughs> yes, <laughs> all oh, eyes what a, are on my table. What a tremendous quote! What I a tremendous on brand quote! Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, By the way, I know there's a lot of Marner signings rumors going around. There's a I lot mean, of smoke. Yeah. Uh, all all I'll say is this. Again, I go back to the agent here, Darren Ferris. His philosophy, and there's a saying when you're dealing with Darren Ferris. You know what it is? What's that? Ride the Ferris wheel. Hmm. Only Jeff, when we're talking about this Ferris wheel, we're not talking about like the safe Ferris wheel you see in 99% of amusement parks. Oh, this is the older older ones where you- No, this would be a Ferris wheel- that violently tosses people around and would be condemned in most places in the world. Oh, my. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing to Darren Ferris? Uh, no, <laughs> this would be the kind of Ferris wheel that would be that throws people around very violently and would be condemned in most uh <laughs> In most jurisdictions. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This would be the kind of Ferris wheel that would jerk people around violently and would be oh, no. condemned and not be allowed to be ridden in most jurisdictions. Oh, my. Oh, well, <laughs> well uh, as everybody in Toronto media likes to say, and I count myself as one of them, the Marner story is the gift that continues to bear fruit. No, actually, that- I want to I change that. You know what okay. the Marner story is like? What? It's like a pot of scalding boiling water that we keep dropping on ourselves. That's what this. No, it's is like. no, it's not. This is like if you're a programmer, like you say, you say to your hosts every day, "Did you talk about Marner?" Oh, it's true. You know, it's true. It's it, it'll it, it'll it'll keep people's attention. You said that the last Marner deal. <laughs> so we always say. All right, <laughs> hitting a break. Uh, Montana's thought line coming up next. Listen to the 32 Thoughts podcast ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to the podcast. Time now for the Montana's Thought Line. Montana's Barbecue and Bar, Canada's home for barbecue. Two thoughts at sportsnet.ca 1 833 3232 As always, thank you for the tunes. Rick Turner of 32 thoughts at sportsnet.ca 1 833 3232 We get to the thought line curated lovingly by Griffin Porter. Here is an interesting one, Elliot. So, okay. Jerry, I will decide if it's interesting. I thought it was interesting, and I actually had to do some research for this one. So, uh, Jeremy submits this. Hi, guys. Love the pod. It will be a long summer without weekly entertainment. Oh, I'm sure you'll get by without us. Uh, <laughs> with the fine. with the Dubois trade, only a year after signing the contract made me think, is it the longest contract residual getting traded? 
with seven years left and nearly $60 million to be paid, is mm. it the biggest contract left over to be traded? Thanks. Keep up the good work. Do you agree with me that this is a good question from Jeremy Elliott? I, I do agree with that. Okay. So here's what I came So, with. Jeff, before you answer this with your quote-unquote research. Thank you. Can I make a guess? By all means, the floor is yours. So my guess is Roberto Luongo. And the reason I guess him is he was traded in March 2014. Yeah. And at that time, there were there were eight years left on his contract. Now, as Canucks fans will remember, that was a back-diving deal, mm -hmm. which is why they were penalized. And I still think that decision was ridiculous. I agree. But anyway, by my unofficial count here, he was still owed... 24, 27, 30, 32, 30, 32, 8. It looks like he was still owed about $33 million, mm -hmm. which is less than Dubois, we should mm -hmm. say. Yeah. Dubois is still owed much more. But 59. Dubois is 59 million. He, yeah, that was the closest one I could think of off okay. the top of my head. Yeah, not even close. Okay, uh, uh, but okay. good try. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do I, get, do I get a participation ribbon for this? Yes, we used to get those in public school. You get a little participation medal. Your parents can <laughs> save it for you. That's very nice. Okay, yeah. so Pierre-Luc Dubois is $59 million. Okay. <sighs> P.K. Subban, Shea Weber deal. Subban had $58 million remaining. Mm -hmm. Shea Weber had $54 million. That's a great pull. That's a good one. That was on that infamous day um, when the call, when the when the Hall Larson deal was made and Steven Stamkos resigned with Tampa. There's another one, um, Jeff Carter, his 11 year, 58 million dollar deal with the Philadelphia Flyers. Now, when he signed it, he had one year remaining on his old deal, but was traded to Columbus before the new deal kicked in. So that was the deal. $58 million. Right. Still, still shy of Pierre-Luc Dubois's 59. I have to I have to hand it to you, Jeff. You've actually had a good day of of research and opinions leading to my <laughs> number one question. Why doesn't this happen more often? I don't know what it is. Uh, that's a lottery ticket day for me, clearly. Now, there is one. So Pierre-Luc Dubois still, to Jeremy's point, Pierre-Luc Dubois... is a great call. Great yeah, call. Yeah, $58 million there. Okay, so, but the other one is a kind of technicality. Okay. How do you feel about Matthew Kachuk? Because technically, he was signed... And they sent the whole deal to Florida. Yeah, it that was one a sign count. and trade. That was a sign and trade. That one doesn't. I count. know, but hang on. But tech, in a court of law, with a skilled attorney, could you not make the case that that should be number one at seventy six million dollars? Well, if you, you, if you, you had a skilled attorney, know, <laughs> you and I both know that if you are ever represented by anyone in a court of law, it's going to be Lionel Hutz. <laughs> so true. you're yes. going to lose. That's a good point. Okay, but if you know, the, the, I'll say this. That's it's it's fair to bring it up and it's a good argument yeah. but to me that's not calgary's contract that's florida's contract and the flames gave him a break okay so that's what i was able to come up with for this one pierre luc dubois You're still the leader at there 59 is still million. technically 76 million 76 that's right that's correct so technically your your winner here is matthew kachuk but to elliot's point that was a sign and trade anyway Great question coming off the Pierre-Luc Dubois Darcy Kemper deal. Okay, from there we go to Paul, who is in the south of Spain. Greetings. Nice. From the I wish I was there. How about this for an opening line? Greetings from the shadow of Gibraltar here in the south of Spain. Holy smokes. Wow, nice trip. A nice, nice life, Paul. Um I was looking at the Detroit Pistons' recent hiring of Trey John Langdon as their new team president and thinking about Eric Tulski, who's yeah. from Michigan and has taken an unusual route to his new job as a GM of the Hurricanes. If the Pistons had wanted to, could they have hired Tulski without asking permission from Carolina? What if an NBA team who had an NHL owner, say like Washington with Ted Leonces, wanted to hire him for the NBA team? Would permission be needed then? 
Thanks for keeping me up to date over here and keeping helping me keep some ties to home. The pods make my day when they drop. And I was glad the Canucks didn't feature as prominently this year compared to last. Could they have hired Tulski without permission? Not if Tulski had a contract. If Tulski had no contract with the Hurricanes, you can do whatever you want. But if he even has, if they're we, hiring for even if hiring for a different sport, yeah, a contract okay. is is a contract. Like he is contracted, assuming he's contracted to work with the Hurricanes, then you have to ask for permission. You know, for example, Jeff, if you were to go from the good telecom to the evil telecom. No, but that's what. No, 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 no. That would that that's that that. I don't think that that's a good comparison. Why I know what you, I, I know what you're going to say because though that's still the same. That's still broadcast. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah, that, that's a fair point. But still, like like if, if it was you, something like no, com- completely you, out of the it, industry. Like say that you wanted to leave to go. I don't know. Work. At, okay. Let, let's just say you wanted to leave for a government job. Like you know, or something like that. Sports mm-hmm. that could technically say to you, you have a contract with us. Like, I personally think they'd be very happy to see you leave, but you do hey, have a whoa, contract whoa, with hey, us. Hey, wow. Oh, shot at me out of nowhere. Okay. <laughs> you, um, yes, but it, now, what, what could happen is maybe, for example, Tulski would have in his contract some outs that allow him to leave at any time. If yeah. that's the case, let me. Um, you could do that. But the bottom line is if you have a contract to work for someone, then you got to work for someone. Okay. And you so, have to. You, now, I think I can say this now because it's been 20 years. But when I left the score or headline sports for Hockey Night in Canada, I had 11 months left on my contract. And the score, we negotiated, had to negotiate an exit. They could have made life very difficult on me and thankfully didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, so we negotiated an exit. I gave up something. They ended the contract. Um, but, you know, if you have a contract to work for someone, you you got to work for someone. Technically, they can say, no, 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 you, you can't do that. Okay, then. Here's here's what I wonder about. So, Paul. I know you South live Spain. in this lawless existence, but, you know, <laughs> there are rules. No, let, let, let's, 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 uh, let's, let's find something here. So. Okay. So, Paul mentions Ted Leonsis. Yeah. Okay. If Ted Leonsis went to Tom Dunn and said, I'm interested in hiring Eric Tolsky to run the basketball team. Yep. Manager's a manager. We wanted this manager to run our basketball team. With the plans that he was going to bring him in, fire him from the basketball team, and hire him from the hockey team. Could he do that? Again, I think it depends on what is written into his contract. Like, like Tom Dundon... You know, first of all, Carolina and Washington are rivals. Last time I checked, both in the Metro. Yeah, like Tom Dundon could just say, I'm not letting you do that. Now, there are ex- executives in the NHL that have things written into their contract that say you can't block them from a promotion. There's not yes. a lot of them, but I've heard they're out there. Yeah. So if Tulski had something in his contract that says you cannot block him from a promotion, then... He can go. So that's it all the way, depends on what the contract says. So that's the way he could get him in on the basketball side with the plans then to transition him back to the hockey side. Yeah. Essentially, it's, it's, essentially it's a way to steal a general manager. Yeah. But these owners don't think that way at all. It's all on the up and up. Let's finish with this one. Zach in Indiana. Dear Frage and Merrick, my name is Zach. I'm a student at Indiana University. My question is, Go how, does Con- how does Conn Smythe trophy voting work if it's tied with 10 minutes left in a game seven and the Conn Smythe isn't completely decided like this year? Mm-hmm. How would that work? So, again, I don't have a vote for the Conn Smythe this year, but I voted for it before. And uh, this is what basically what happens. You have to submit. In any game that's a potential decider, like, for example, even when it was whatever the score was at the end of the second period in game four, whether it was 4-1 or 5-1, I can't remember, um, you have to submit your votes, your top three votes, uh, by the end of the second period. They always want them just in case. If there's a miracle comeback, just in case. In a situation like that, like, say, for example, the, the, the what was provided by the question, 
you can do qualifiers. You can say, here's my one, two, and three. But if this guy scores like the overtime winner or this goalie wins the game, they're my con Smythe vote. You can do that. Hmm. You can put in qualifiers. Now, I try not to do that that much because it, it can make the whole thing crazy. However, um, I, I there are situations where you are allowed to write in. Like say, say we're in game seven, it's tied. It, it, like if this play you can put, let, let's go with this. McDavid won, Bobrovsky two, Barkov three. But then say like if Barkov scores the Stanley Cup winning goal, I want him to be my Conn Smythe Trophy winner. You can mm. do stuff like that. That is allowed. Uh, but you I have to be very specific right. with your condition. You can't just say, oh, if he looks good in the third period, give him the Conn Smythe. No, that doesn't work. <laughs> it's, you have to be specific. Uh, Zach in Indiana, great question. Uh, an interesting answer as well. Uh, the Montana's Thought Line, Montana's Barbecue and Bar, Canada's home for barbecue. We're back in a moment. Jeff Elliott and Tom and 32 Thoughts try their ribs today. Back to 32 Thoughts, the podcast presented by the GMC Sierra Elevation. And a couple of things coming off our last podcast. One, um, got a note from someone um, commenting on, well, actually, we got a lot of notes about the mesh and Marty Berdur cutting the mesh. And a lot of people have pointed out that it is a tradition in college hockey still. And I got a note from one person who pointed out that in the NHL, it is not allowed. Uh, because that mesh gets sold to either card companies, jersey companies, um, and all, that all, although it's not substantial, still counts as part of hockey-related revenue. Um, they do the same thing with um, the ice when they take it out, when they melt it. Um, that ends up getting sold as well. So just to follow up on the mesh in the NHL, it's not as if we're going to see a run on goaltenders clipping the mesh because the NHL owns that, thank you very much, and can make a little bit of a profit off of it. The other thing... Oh, that's, that's, I, I had no idea. That's a good one, bud. Yeah. So the, the other thing is... Um, we had a lot of people commenting on the workout that you did with Kevin Bieksa yes, and David Amber and Cal Bacascus. All the people who pointed out the the genesis of the Murphy yes. workout really appreciated yes. that. So it's called now one that I want to highlight here. This comes to us from Adam. And Adam, we thank you for your service. A proud member of the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. Uh, let me read this email. Uh, Jeff Elliott and Dom, first love the pod. I'm in the Canadian Army and your shows keep me in stitches during our long runs and workouts here in Edmonton. Wow. Great topic on the last show about fitness challenges, specifically the mile run followed by the 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 squats, followed by a final one mile run. This is actually a CrossFit hero workout called MRF. Named after U.S. Navy SEAL Lieutenant Michael Murphy, who was killed in Afghanistan June 28, 2005. Although typically done in body armor for time, there are a ton of ways to adjust the intensity of the workout so all can pay tribute to Murph in their own way. Bands, ring rows, TRX straps, to name a few. A Kevin, Canadian... I believe, wears a 20-pound vest. I, I think yeah. Kevin has worn a 20-pound vest doing it. That surprises nobody. Yeah, yeah. A Canadian version of the Murph is known as Nuts, named after a friend of mine, Lieutenant Andy Nuttle, who was killed in Afghanistan on December 23, 2009. Give this one a try. 10 handstand push-ups, 250-pound deadlift 15 times, 25 box jumps, 50 pull-ups, 100 wall ball shots, 200 double unders, and run 400 meters with a 45 pound plate, all for time. It's a doozy. Thanks for all your great work. Adam from the Princess Patricia's Canada Light Infantry, thank you so much for that email. And also, we had some people, most notably Ian, who were in to remind everybody that um, Michael Murphy, Lieutenant Michael Murphy, attended Penn State where he played hockey as well. So to Elliot's point, 
thanks to everyone who uh, who emailed in and reminded us about the Murph. Yes, thank you very much. It was uh, it was meaningful to hear all these responses yeah. and all these people paying proper tribute yes. to those who created these workouts or inspired these workouts. Speaking of which, Kevin in Philadelphia sends a tip for Elliot. He says, I always do it in 50 sets of two pull-ups, four push-ups, and six squats. It takes a while, but it helps. And yeah, the I website don't, I don't have any problem with that. The that's, Murph that's a good idea. Yeah. You can go to the website, themurfchallenge.com to find out, you know, what this workout is all about and the different variations of it. Uh, Kevin in Philadelphia, thanks for the email. He says, good luck, Elliot. Your arms will be useless for a few days and weeks <laughs> after. I just want to say they're already useless now, but I appreciate <laughs> the tip. Before we bid everyone good evening or good morning or good afternoon, depending on when you're listening to this, our, the podcast that won't stop. Um, someone we should shout out specifically, someone that we've worked with um, in Toronto radio for a number of years, while well, going back to May 5th, 2003 specifically, and that is Lance Kennedy. Yep. A, uh, Lance is a technical director yep. for Sportsnet. Uh, he's worked on uh, the board uh, for a long, long time. A lot of times uh, he would call me, Jeff, to come on their show. Yep. I remember one time uh, he put me on the show, and this, this is just a funny story. And he went to the bathroom and we got cut out. And like he just wasn't there, and you had to talk for like five minutes until he got back. Like it's no one, it's no one's fault. It's just no, you, just gotta guy, go you squirt, gotta man. You, you gotta go. You gotta go. And uh, but just like a guy who was always He's around, did awesome. his job. No yep. complaints, low so, maintenance. Yeah. And he's leaving us. He's worked. Um, so it's 21 years uh, that he was at the fan and he's leaving for a position outside the industry. Years. Right. It's a long time. Lance Kennedy, a long time, May 5th, 2003. So I mentioned on the radio show on Friday uh, when he started the Maple Leafs. Lost Game 7 to the Philadelphia Flyers. You remember the Jeremy Rona goal? You yes, remember I the do. Darcy Tucker hit on Sammy Kapanen? Yes, um, I do. The Blue Jays were managed by Carlos Tosca. Oh, my and goodness. Do you want to hear the Jays' rotation when Lance started at the fan? 2003, so it'll be Roy Halladay. Bingo, yes. Corey Lytle. Yeah, keep oh, going. I was going. Esteban okay. Eliza? Nope. Okay, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Corey Lytle, Joey yeah. Hamilton? No. <sighs> Who else? No Joey Hamilton. No. No Esteban. Was Ted Lilly there? No. <sighs> I got the easy one. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. <laughs> Who, who, uh, okay, give them to me. Calvin Escobar. Oh, Mark, I should have got that. Mark Hendrickson and Doug Davis. Oh, my God. I, I could have guessed until I died and I was not getting <laughs> Doug Davis. J.S. Jaguar won the Consumite Trophy in a losing cause against the New Jersey Devils. Um, yeah, but the, I remember the, that. The, the one thing, like he did, I mean, he was like, like honestly, he he was a board op for like Gord Stelic and Don Landry, uh, Mike Hogan and Chuck Swirsky, like so all the Hockey Central guys, uh, Doug Faraway, Norm Rumack, Roger Lajoie, like so many. And by the way, he always said I was his favorite. Um, so yeah, many Blake Murphy did. now and Dan DeLevy and Jack Armstrong and Stephen Brunt and Bob McCowan and Barb DiGiulio and, and, and. But you know what I always think about when I think about Lance? A lot of times when, like pretty much every time, whenever there's a guest on the line and we're coming back from break, he'll just, you know, get in my ear and say, your guest so-and-so is there. And he'll always have a line about the guest or about something that just happened in sports that honestly, Elliot, would crack me up every time. And you see it if you watch the show on Sportsnet 360, usually coming back from break when there's a guest on the line, I'm laughing. And it's because something that Lance just said in my ear. I still maintain that if you put all those together, it's one of the best shows the fan never had. And he was one of the funniest guys that you would never know because it was only between him and the host. And Elliot, I like to think that he only did it for me 
but there's not a chance. Lance Kennedy did it for everybody. Lance, if you're listening, best of luck in your next career. We are all thrilled for you. And you made it, you made the fan a wonderful place to come to every single day. With that, we'll wrap up. Enjoy game seven on Monday. We'll talk to you again Tuesday. <laughs>